right. So yeah, that brings us to our featured guest speaker today, who is Dr. Stephen Shapersman. Uh, Dr. Shapersman is a consultant scientist and founder and president of Texas Citizens for Science, an advocacy group that defends the accuracy and integrity of science inst instruction in Texas public schools. Uh, among other things, he actively opposes teaching creationism as science in public schools. Uh, Shaperman holds a BS in geology and biology from Northern Illinois University, an MS in geology and a PhD in geology from Rice University. He specialized in invertebrate paleontology, stratigraphy, and sedimentary petrology. I hope I pronounced all this. Oh anyway, uh, he has been a pro-science activist since 1980, creating the Free Inquiry website dedicated to educating the public on humanism and skepticism, and the Texas Citizens for Science website committed to opposing the representation of religious concepts such as intelligent design and creationism as science in Texas textbooks. Dr. Schaefer has been also formally contributed to a blog column for the Houston Chronicle at Evosphere blog. Uh, and it's not on here, but uh, Dr. Jacobson has been uh, very prominent historically in the Houston Free Thought community, including in our organization um, in the past. So, and uh, he will also share some of that uh, with us today. So please welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Jacobson. Thank you, Dr. Shapersman. Thank you very much, Vic, for that introduction. And good evening, everybody. Uh, you can probably all hear me. I was, uh, I lectured at, in huge lecture halls at the University of Houston, 300 students at once, and I never used the microphone, so I can really project my voice pretty well. Um, I want to, I'll, we'll get to this topic in a moment, but um, Vic asked me to share a few, a few uh, stories with you. Um, your current organization, Humanists of Houston, I'm one of the founders of it. It, um, the original Humanist of Houston was founded in 1978, I believe, by about eight or ten individuals uh, who got their names on the American Humanist Association certificate to found the, uh, the organization. Uh, they did have meetings. At the meetings, they would talk and discuss things and gossip, and occasionally one of them would give a presentation and that's all they did. They didn't interact with the community at all. They didn't uh, challenge the pervasive pseudoscience, uh, ultra-religionism, um, fundamentalism that's in Houston. It still is. Uh, speaking of, and also the, uh, the horrible bigotry and discrimination, all of which are manifestations of a religious war on people. I gave a talk here last year, uh, the Republican War on, on Everything. Uh, we have a political party, the Republicans, which are totally dominated in Texas by the Tea Party, which are the ultra-religious right Republicans. And they're the ones who have declared war on women, poor people, the environment, gays, uh, science, education, you name it. Everything good, progressive, liberal, they've declared war on it. And they're, they're always angry because they keep losing. And as you know, they lost yesterday and they lost today. And they're going to keep losing. They've lost to science already, although they, they deny it. They deny climate change. They deny evolution. And the latest thing is they deny that injection of, of hydraulic fracturing fluids causes earthquakes, which it most certainly does. That's the reason we have those earthquake storms in Texas and Oklahoma. It's by wastewater injection from fracking operations. But they deny that too. They deny everything that fits in with their views. So I've been fighting them for years. Uh, since the humanists of Houston never did anything to oppose all these things, another fellow and I, he was equally dissatisfied with the group. And I could, I could go into more detail about this, with names and stuff, but I'm not. We found it high, humanists involved in greater Houston. And we, we were activists and we, uh, we did things. I founded Texas Citizens for Science to oppose the creationists. I, uh, I ran for the school board twice in Houston. I ran two years ago in West Texas for the school board a third time. Each time I lost. It's hard for a, a Democrat, especially a liberal Democrat, to be elected uh, in, in certain districts. Uh, in West Texas, in, uh, in West Houston, 
And I uh, did lose all those elections, unfortunately. And look at the result. Texas still, after 30 years of advocacy and explaining things to the uh, state board members, we still are at the bottom five of all, of all the states in, in academic achievement and success. All the statistics show this. I remember going to the state board meetings and showing them the results of the SATs. Our students taking the SATs, we were 48th and 49th in the country in math and verbal on the results of our SATs. These were students who attempted to go on to college. We still are in the bottom five or so on you know, all the tests that we have. Uh, we have a very, very bad public education system in Texas. Uh, it's not generally known because the people involved in administering it uh, constantly uh, tell stories and exaggerate the results of their work. And I don't blame the teachers for this. It's not the teacher's fault. It's not the student's fault. It's, uh, in some ways, it's the parents' fault because who I do believe blame are the superintendents and especially the state education officials who um, have kept their, their incredible centralized authority uh, on public education in very negative ways. We have a school board that, that, um, that requires all sorts of bizarre, crazy instruction in social studies and history and biology and earth science. They have kept the age of the earth out of books. They have kept evolution out of books as best they can. We, through a lot of work, we've gotten evolution into the biology books and so forth. So we, we've, we've been making great strides, but still, the constant pressure from the state to, to, on teachers to hide things from students, to, uh, to, um, to fool them, really, to tell them things that aren't true, yeah, that's what happens. And I know that in Midland, they don't teach evolution in the biology classes. And they didn't in, in Houston, either. They still may not. I don't know. But uh, it was very bad. There have been studies that have shown that about half the teachers in Texas don't te teach evolution at all. Biology teachers don't teach evolution at all. Those are statistical studies. And about 10 to 15 percent teach creationism instead. And that's typical for the South, anyway. That's not unusual. That's typical for the South. Uh, things don't change. Of course, the rest of the world doesn't have these, these uh, problems with fundamentalist religion forcing their, their twisted and bizarre values on them. So, they are advancing, they have better health care systems, better education systems, and they're really doing well. All the Asian countries and the European countries. I, uh, later, after uh, high existed for about 15 years as high, HOH just disappeared. Um, uh, high, high, I left, I left in 94, and I didn't pay attention to what happened. But later, after I left, the people in High changed their name back to the Humanists of Houston. So the organization that you are now is the one that Frank Prowl and I uh, founded. Frank moved to west, the west coast of Florida, where I visit twice a year with my wife to visit her mother, who used to live there. And I, I used to meet Frank. He lived uh, down near Clearwater. And we'd get together. And, I always gave a talk to the Suncoast Humanists and another talk to the Tampa Bay Skeptics. And for about five or six years, I gave at least two talks every Christmas to these groups on a variety of topics, the Shroud of Turin, uh, humanism and atheism, uh, all sorts of skept skeptical to topics dealing with, with the science of my activities. So um, it was really neat. And I, I, don't even, I haven't talked to Frank in many years. I hope he's still around. I was also involved in Houston with uh, the American Atheists, which pre-existed the Humanist group. American Atheists was one of the first uh, AA chapters, American Atheist chapters in, in the United States. Obviously, it's the largest city near, near Austin. Uh, Madeline used to come uh, frequently. I met her at least six or seven times. I even went to Austin a couple of times and visited with her. So I knew, I knew Madeline Murray O'Hare. And I have stories to tell about her, which I'm not going to share with you now. That would take forever. But I could go on and on with these, these things. You showed a slide of, of um, Kay Staley, which uh, that really 
brought back memories. I was on the board of the uh, uh, Greater Houston ACLU in the 80s. Uh, they had that Bible in a case outside City Hall. And I, I suggested as a board member, why don't we challenge that? Why don't we litigate that Bible? And they said, no, we don't really want to spend any resources on that. It's just a Bible sitting in a stupid glass case. We have more important things to litigate, like the harm actually being done to people by the city and by the police. Back in the 80s, two-thirds of the ACLU docket was police abuse of minorities. Two-thirds. And um, they didn't want to take on a lot of church state things, although they did take on a few. Once the, uh, the uh, county commissioner, the Harris County commissioner, uh, the judge, the judge of Harris County Court, put up uh, three crosses, giant crosses in a park, Deer Creek Park, right here, Deer Creek Park, with a memorial, war memorial, they called it. But it was three craw giant crosses. So we had to go to court to get that those three crosses removed because they were obviously uh, not a war memorial, but a uh, depiction of Christianity in a, in, a, in a county park. And I testified in that trial. And uh, he won. He won that. He had to remove those three crosses. They took them down in the dead of night, about two, between 2 and 4 a.m. So nobody would be there to see it. That's when they came down. And I, and I thought, well, if we can do that, why can't we get rid of the Bible in the case? So anyway, I, I knew Kay Stately from various activities, and I actually dated her several times. Uh, she was, I wouldn't call her my girlfriend, but we did go out. And uh, later, when she challenged on her own, with her own money, she hired an attorney to get rid of that Bible in those cases at City, at City Hall. Uh, she, she, I called her, and I said, I said, Okay, that's great. I'm glad you're doing this. You really are uh, wonderful to spend your own money to do this. And you know, she won. I didn't think they, she'd win, but she did. And she had a good attorney, and they, they did it right. And I called her back to congratulate her. I said, well, that's wonderful. I told her the story that I had suggested the ACLU do it, and they refused. The board didn't want to do it. Actually, it wasn't the board. It was the executive director and the, and the head attorney at that time. Um, the, head, the head attorney of our time uh, later became the chief attorney for the whole national ACLU. He was a good attorney. I remember him quite well. And uh, they did so much work. And then, uh, just the year I left Houston, in, in 1994, the, the Texas ACLU, which had been completely moribund practically, decided they were going to reactivate themselves. So they went after the most active, largest chapter in the state of all, that was Houston. Houston ACLU, and they took it over, and they forced them to give them all their money and, their, and their, all their records and all their cases, and they moved everything to Austin. That was the uh, Texas ACLU, and um, they did a good, then after that, even though it was harsh on the people I knew, I was in another state at that time. I had moved to Ohio, but I thought, oh, this is ridiculous. They, uh, they, uh, later took a lot of cases all over the state. They really have been very good since that time. But I, I realized that just a few years ago, they moved back to Houston. And now the national ACLU, the, the state ACLU office is in Houston now, no longer in Austin, where it had been for many years. And I know, I know the, uh, the president and the legal director of the Texas ACLU because I've talked with them about all sorts of things that go on in the state. So I thought, well, gosh, they wanted, they'd rather be in Houston. That's good. So I have a lot of uh, past history with, with, with things in the, uh, really the 1980s and the early 90s. And then after I left Texas, I didn't uh, stay involved. I moved on to other things. But I moved back to West Texas now 15 years ago. And, uh, I, I work in the oil industry and I, I teach. I still teach sometimes. I used to teach at the university. And my wife, who's here with us tonight, she is a biology professor at the University of Texas in West Texas. So, so uh, and I, could, I could go on and on, but let's not bother with that. Is that enough, enough stuff? Okay, now let's turn. Um, and by the way, I've, uh, this has been a wonderful education, all the things I did when I went after the creationists. I had nothing but success for years and years against the creationists in Texas. And it wasn't just me helping. From 1980, when I started the Texas Citizens for Science group, 
1994, People for the American Way was in Texas, and they had a, had a person in Austin who did a great job, Mike Hudson, who later became the vice president of People for the American Way. And he and I worked together on, on fighting the State Board of Education and lobbying the legislature and things like that. He was a very, very good person, and, and honestly, he did more than I did during those, those later years because he was in Austin, he had a staff. His staff was his wife, who was his administrative assistant. And he also had, had money from the National Americans United, I mean, the people for the American Way. So they moved out, and they thought their job was done. And then um, Cecile Richards' uh, daughter started Texas Freedom Network just at that time. And they took over, essentially, what people for the American Way were doing. And they've been doing a good job ever since, too. They're a good group. And, and frankly, they, they do more than I do. Uh, with their huge staff, they have, about, they have about eight people paid, paid on staff. They have dozens of volunteers. They have a lot of money. And uh, they've been doing a great job fighting the creationists on the state board, in the legislature, all the, the right-wing bigots and the, the, um, the people who engage in discrimination. And that's a very good organization. Now, they're not a humanist organization. No. You, you're probably aware of that. They, uh, they have a clergy project. They, uh, they use the, the ministers. Uh, some of them are religious, but they're liberal Democrats. I can vouch for that. They all are. You probably knew that. And they're doing good things. So they are opposing the religious right in Texas, which is essentially what I've been doing. So it's been a, it's been a great, um, what is it now, 35 years? Oh my gosh, really something. I wish I could do more, but I'm involved in all sorts of things. So let me talk now, tonight, about this topic. Um, the audacity of duplicity. Now you all know what duplicity means, right? It means lying. They're audacious. They prevaricate. They lie. And believe me, they are audacious because they're willing to lie and, and prevaricate about everything. And, and by they, I mean the radical religious right Republicans, the three R Republicans also known as the Republican Tea Party people. Unfortunately, in our state, because of the way uh, the state is organized politically, the gerrymandered districts, uh, 600,000 people control who the Republican nominees are for offices. Uh, the Republicans always get elected. These 600,000 are the most right-wing, bigoted, extremist people you can imagine. They, they vote in the primaries for the Republicans. And that's who we end up with as governor and attorney general and lieutenant governor. Uh, it's just terrible. And you know what's really terrible is that the Democrats could have won year after year after year if they just voted. We could, we could beat them if just the Democrats in our state voted. But they won't. They, uh, they don't feel that for some reason that it's useful, I guess. So they keep losing to these extremists. And this is one, one item. I'm going to talk about tax credit voucher schemes, also known as tax credit scholarships or top tax credit tuition grants to transfer public education money to private religious schools. So this is money, state money, public money that is, that is transferred to private religious schools. And it, it's, it's a pretty bad situation. So in January this year, they had a rally on the steps of the Capitol. And here, here they are. School choice now. What is school choice? You'd be amazed. It's a, it's a framing. If you know what framing is, they're framing the topic. They're attempting to frame the topic. That means they're attempting to present what they're doing in the most positive terms possible. But of course, it's a giant lie. So they get, they get kids out there, they put the yellow scarves on them, and they have the signs, pre-printed signs. Choice means hope. So here they are, speakers, uh, esteemed political figures. There's the Capitol, of course. They even have a band, and the band has those, those yellow scarves also. Donna Campbell. She is Senator Donna, Donna Campbell uh, from Ron Fells, 
she is uh, an educated person. She's a doctor of ophthalmology, so she's a no, she's an emergency doctor. Excuse me, I'm thinking of somebody else. I think she does that. She is uh, highly educated. She's also an extremist uh, Tea Party Republican. Uh, of course, she's a bigot. She uh, she's against gays. She's against minorities. She's against public education. And she wants to push, using her power, she wants to push her values onto the citizens of Texas. And that's what they all do. As soon as they get elected, they want to push their values because they're now representatives of their politicians, public officials. They have the power to do that. That's what they do. She was involved in lots of things, not just this. Recognize this guy? This is a grandson of George Herbert Walker Bush. He's the son of Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush is the son of George H.W. Bush, the brother of George H. Bush, George W. Bush, who uh, wants to be president in his own right. He wants to be president too. That's all this state needs is a third Bush around, or a third Bush as president. Haven't two Bushes been enough? ruin our country? I don't think he has a chance. He's actually, um, he, he presents a persona of being, of being pleasant and nice, but he's got the same bizarre, crazy, extreme ideas that his brother has. Not the father. The father was a little more moderate, but he's much like his, his brother, George W. Bush. Anyway, his son, of course, you know, Jeb Bush is the one married to uh, a woman of Hispanic American origin. Okay. I think she's Mexican. Yeah. This is his son, uh, George P. Bush. George P. Bush. There he is. They got him to be on the stand. And he's very happy to be part of this movement. So right away you know that this movement is bad. It's bad for <laughs> students, it's bad for teachers, it's bad for public education. Anytime a Bush gets involved with this, you know it's going to be bad. Who's behind the effort for school choice? Now, I have to apologize to you. Um, you're not supposed to put a lot of typing, writing, and text on PowerPoint slides. You're supposed to put a lot of pictures, and then I do the talking. The fact is, is I don't have notes here. I'm not looking at my, my laptop with the notes there. If I had them, I could just say them. So I have to remind, these are my notes. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you who's behind the effort for school choice. Uh, the Tea Party Republicans, which are the three R Republicans, or radical religious right wing Republicans. You can call them the four R's or the three R Republicans. Now, these are not conservatives. They call themselves conservatives, but they're flattering themselves. They are radicals. They are extremists. None of these people has anything to do with, with real conservatism. Um, they're not fiscal conservatives. They're not social conservatives. They are radicals. Just look at how Bush and his radical fiscal policy screwed up our financial system. Their social policies are extreme. They're not conservative. Uh, also, they don't care about the rule of law. They don't care about fair play. They don't care about not lying. They lie readily. They're, they're just liars. And that's not being conservative. A conservative is someone who respects tradition, who doesn't want to make changes too rapidly, who wants to keep the the good things that are in the past going. But they don't, they don't care about that. They're willing to spend trillions of dollars on wars that are completely crazy wars, hopeless wars, and they want to keep having one war after another. And of course, uh, Jeb Bush, if he was elected president, we'd be in another war, without question. Fundamentalist Protestant schools, Catholic parochial schools, and of course our public leaders, Abbott and Patrick, in almost all Texas Republican senators are behind this. What is school choice? Aha. School choice is the duplicitous euphemism Texas 3R Republicans use for their goal of requiring the state, through legislation, that is their legislation, to provide several educational options at public expense. So they want to spend state money on certain options so that all the students Texas can, can do this. Now, one of these options is giving money to private schools. And as I'm going to explain to you later, 
85% of private schools in Texas are religious schools. Nationally, it's 80%. 80% 80 of private schools in the country are religious. In Texas, it's 85%. So basically, what they want to do is, is um, send money to religious schools in Texas. And I'm going to just use that from now on. The private school concept is, is a euphemism. They're hiding their true meaning. Uh, at the public hearings, the, the public testimony before the senators in Austin, I listened to it using the, uh, the web feed. I watched them. I watched Kent Grusendorf sit there and lie and lie and lie. Um, I saw the, the, the main lobbyists against the school choice people. He's, a, he's the president of Raise Your Hand Texas, which is an organization composed of uh, former uh, ch chairs of the, uh, not chairs, uh, directors of TEA, uh, established superintendents, uh, people, people who are generally moderate, not conservative, but moderate educators who really care about children. There's an organization that they, they have called Raise Your Hand Texas, which is opposed to vouchers and tuition tax credit scholarships. He never said the word religion once. He, he kept saying private schools. But everybody knew what, what they meant by private schools, either Grusendorf saying it or, or this fellow saying it. They knew that this, was, this money was going to go to religious schools. School choice, the euphemism, is a radical change in how K-12 education operates and is financed in this state and country. So school choice, the name itself is a lie. That's the first du duplicitous thing they have. What is the spectrum of school choice? We have a lot of school choice right now. That's available now. Now the first one is one we don't have. Whether it's no or yes, that's in Texas. All of these exist somewhere in this country. Mandatory interdistrict public school choice, allowing parents to send their children to different public schools, regardless of the zip code or school district. Not yet. There's no formal program for that. But a lot of, some states have this. If you don't like your, your school, you don't think your children is getting a good education, you can ask and you must be allowed to send your children to the school of their choice across the district. They're just bus there. Okay? And really, there's nothing wrong with that. You're going from one public school to another public school. And if, if the mind of the parent that this is better for their children, well, that's great. But this is an option in, in some schools in this country, in some districts, and it's okay. Public charter schools. These are free public schools that are empowered to innovate and are held accountable for results. Charter schools are public schools. Now, some of them are run as private, like private schools. Some of them are religious in nature, but they're not supposed to teach religion. They are supposed to be secular. They are not supposed to be religious. Some of them are. They break the law. One of the things that Zach, um, um, what's Zach? Coughlin. Co co yeah, Zach. Coughlin. What? Coughlin. Cop Cough Coughlin. I forgot. I keep forgetting. Zach Coughlin. Uh, he did a wonderful investigation of a, a, a group of charter schools that were doing this. They were teaching religious things in their classroom. Illegally, they're not supposed to do that. He, they pub he published this in Salon and uh, got, got some good attention. Now, I have been saying for years that this has been going on. I knew it had been. Um, but I didn't do the work of investigating it, the journalistic work of investigating it and publishing it. Zach did, Zach Coughlin did, to his credit. Uh, most charter schools are not teaching religion. They are teaching the state curriculum, which is what they're obligated to teach. They're obligated to teach evolution, the old age of the earth, that's what's in the state curriculum. After much effort, we have gotten those topics in. I was involved in the effort to get evolution in the standard, the curriculum standards for biology in Texas. That happened in the mid, in, uh, the mid 90s. Well, Bush was governor, George W. Bush was governor. It happened because it was, they were not attacked. They didn't want to make George W. Bush look like an idiot. 
being the governor of the state that was fighting to get modern biology taught in the state. So it was allowed to happen, which was lucky. Now that Bush is gone and we have the Tea Party in charge, they're trying to reverse that. And it's hard to get evolution taught in this state, uh, but the books are filled with evolution. The textbooks are excellent. I've been, I've been working, lobbying for and advocating for those textbooks for decades, and we did get them filled with evolution. I don't know how much work it does. The student's got to be interested enough to open it up and, and um, read it, I guess. So charter schools are an option. These are public schools. They're paid for by the state. The, the teachers are certified. And the, the, they had to take the state mandatory tests. Now we have the star tests and the end of course tests. They're, they have to take those. We, we know the results. I might tell you that most charter schools are deplorable. They do badly on all the state tests. Most charter schools in the country are bad. They, are, they perform worse than the public schools. There have been numerous studies, as you can imagine, by education professionals. Charter schools usually perform no better than public schools, and often worse, usually worse. I just want you to know that. Now, there are exceptions. There are some charter schools that, that do perform better. The KIPP academies are very good. The New Harmony uh, ones, taught by the Turkish people, <coughs> the Turkish scientists and mathematicians, they do pretty well. But that's it. Most charter schools are bad. So and by the way, yeah, go ahead. So people just open these schools, these charter schools? Anybody can open one. And get it, get it, get it certified by the register with the state, and start doing it, and start getting the money in. You get, you get the state. See, when every student in a school gets a certain amount of money from the state. It's about eight thousand dollars a student. If you get, if you get a uh, hundred students at eight, at eight thousand uh, dollars, that's eight hundred thousand dollars. Okay, is that right? Eight hundred, hundred students, yeah, eight hundred thousand. That's a lot of money. You can you can hire teachers. You can teach them. Uh, it's there are some for-profit charter schools. Some of them are for-profit. Some of them are non-profit. Okay, but they all have the job of teaching these students according to the standards of the state. And they're, they're obligated to teach teach it without teaching religion, because they're they're public they're public schools. And as you know, in our country, government institutions by constitutional mandate cannot establish religion. You must be secular. All government offices must be secular and, and, and spin-offs from those, like the school systems, must be secular. Public magnet schools, free public schools that are focused around specific themes such as math and science or the arts. Now I am really in favor of magnet schools. These are the best things imaginable. If your child is ambitious and wants to learn math and science or to do something in the arts, you should have a magnet school for them. And the big districts have them, and they're very good. Uh, some of the finest science high schools in, in the country <coughs> and in the world are magnet schools. You probably know the ones in New York City, right? The Brooklyn Academy of Science and this Stuyvesant School. school. So those, that's a good idea. By the way, what was the reason for the charter school? I don't want to get into the details. Why do we have charter schools? They were, they were proposed as an alternative to the regular traditional public schools to provide competition, to, to use alternate teaching methods and alternate study habits in order to, to do an experiment, to be an experiment to, uh, to help improve student education. Believe me, the, the experiment has failed. Now let me tell you the real reason for charter schools. Um, the people that proposed them and advocated for them um, wanted, pri wanted private religious schools paid for by the state, but they couldn't get them. They were voted down. Every time uh, there has been a constitutional referendum on a, on a voucher system for public schools, two-thirds of the voters have turned it down. It's a very unpopular idea when put to a referendum. And charter schools were then going to be the substitute. They were going to be the substitute to try to get, as I tell it, the camel's nose under the tent. If you can start with the camel's nose, later the whole rest of that smelly, ugly beast is going to be inside your tent. So this was going to be the start of getting 
private religious schools paid for by the state, start with charter schools. Since we couldn't get the private religious schools right at the start, let's do it this way. And about half of the charter schools and charter school systems are associated with religious organizations in Texas. Now, it's not that high number nationally, but it's big in Texas. And believe me, I am sure that they all teach religion somehow, maybe before or after school or at lunchtime, probably not in class. Some of them do teach it in class, as Zach Coughlin discovered. He, uh, he used the T Texas Public Information Act to get the materials they used, their teaching materials, and that proved that they were doing this. Unbelievable. And that is, that is not only uh, <coughs> mendacious and sick that they would do that, but that's what we have. And, and of course, when that happens, the TEA is supposed to get rid of them. They have the power to review them and get rid of them. Did they ever get rid of those charter schools? No. We still, they're still hanging around because uh, they wanted them. That's the whole point. They want them to be the stepping stone, the camel's nose under the tent for private religious schools. Online learning. These are the full-time online free public schools that students can, can attend rather than a traditional bricks and mortar school. These are the virtual academies and virtual schools. Now these can be good or bad. Depending on the curriculum, they can be good or bad. I'm not going to go into detail about online education. I happen to be an expert on distance education or online education. I was one of the pioneers in that. And uh, sometimes it, it's a good idea, sometimes it isn't. It depends on the type of student. It depends on the, the curriculum. It depends on how you present the curriculum to the student, how you design the, the testing, the assessment, and the presentation of materials. It's very complex. I don't want to get into that. But that is another option, which is free. We do have that in Texas. So you see we have charter schools, magnet schools, online learning. Homeschooling. Freedom, allowing parents the ability to educate children in their home. Yes, we have that in Texas. Now, the vast majority of homeschoolers are religious. They don't want their children attending the public school and be subjected to all the evils, evil influences of drugs and sex that you have in the public schools, right? And believe me, the, the, the drugs and the sex is there, especially in Texas, since birth control information is essentially forbidden. It has been forbidden for years. So, uh, sex is pretty obvious because the, the teenage girls keep getting pregnant. They never learn about contraception, about, about uh, birth control, family planning. It's really a sick state that, that allows this deliberately and then punishes them, forcing them to try to get an abortion, which is very difficult in Texas for these, these kids, these 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds. But we have that, and there are some parents that are have homeschool their kids that um, and not for religious reasons. They do it because they want their kids to get a better education in the public school, and there's nothing wrong with that. They really do a good job, and those kids are smart. And I've known I've known some students who uh, are homeschooled, and they're they are smart. One of them um, is now majoring in systematic botany at Sol Ross University. <coughs> He was learning all the plants. Now, I, I learned all the plants once at, in Michigan. I did that. And I was not homeschooled, so I admire that. He's interested in, in natural, natural things, in the, body, in the, in the plants. So here we come to the last one. Private school choice. State programs that provide scholarships, tax credits, tax deductions, school vouchers, uh, tuition tax credits, uh, tuition uh, tax credit savings grants, tuition tax credit tuition scholarships, there's a lot of things, the, to use as a portion of the tax funds are set aside for the children's education to send their children to private schools. In Texas, this is not legal. We do have, however, 16 states that allow this in this country. They are able to get it through, and I'll explain why they're able to do it. And basically, I'm going to explain why if Texas chooses to do it, it's, they can be, do it legally. Even though this sounds very uh, uh, unconstitutional, it's possible to do. Now, this is school choice. Look at all the options we have. 
Those, those people were demanding school choice with their signs, right? What they were demanding was not school choice. They already have school choice. These are their choices. What they were demanding was their choice of schools they're paid for by the state, the, the religious schools. Their choice was religious schools paid for by the state. They didn't want to spend their own money on these. And there are lots of reasons for this. Uh, they, they're resentful that they're forced, they're forced to pay for the education of others using the property taxes. But their own children, uh, they, uh, if they go to a private school, they've got to pay for that too, right? So they resent that. And what they really resent is that these, that their property tax dollars are being paid for the public schools, which in Texas is now a majority minority state. The majority of students in Texas public schools are Hispanics and African Americans. They really resent the fact that their property taxes are paying for minorities. So it's, it's a matter of racism. These three R Republicans, these Tea Party Republicans are racist. Those advocating for school choice. They don't believe in the, in the <clears throat> policy that public education exists to educate the whole population because that benefits everybody. That benefits the workers, the uh, people getting jobs, it benefits society. Now my wife and I don't have any children, but we're happy to pay property taxes to educate children because it benefits society. Mm -hmm. We want to live in a good, healthy society. But they don't want to do that. To them, that's they want to spend the money only on their own kids and send them to the private religious school of their choice. And to hell with the minority students in the public schools. Because believe me, when you spend state tax dollars on religious schools, that money is taken away from the public schools. So what's the difference between vouchers and tuition tax credits? Vouchers are a direct legislative appropriation of public tax money from the state to pay private and religious schools. Parents receive payment certificates called vouchers from state government to pay for private religious schools. So that's a direct transfer of funds from the state government to the parent. Tuition tax credits are a cryptic, corrupt, and hypocritical method to divert public tax money owed the state to pay for children's education in private religious schools. And in Texas, it's, it's religious schools. 85% of private schools are religious. How do tuition tax credits work? Now, I explained how vouchers work. It's a direct government grant to the parents. Tuition tax credits work this way. Businesses in Texas or individuals in Arizona, and you'll see why I have Arizona up here in a short while. Arizona invented this concept. They are the forerunners, the pathfinders for this. They invented it, and it's now spread to 15 other states, 16 states total. So in Arizona is individuals. In Texas, we don't have individual individual income tax. We have we have business taxes. So they want to take the money from businesses. Can voluntarily donate money to special education assistant operations. That's what they're called in Texas. Special, they're called educational assistant organizations. Now none exist at the moment. They don't exist now. But they want them to. Or school tuition organizations in Arizona. And these do exist, believe me. School tuition organizations do exist in Arizona. These, these special organizations are registered, certified, and administered by the state. Okay, So the state has heavy control on these, as it must. Since the state is behind this plan, this money is being transferred from businesses or individuals through these organizations. The educational assistant organizations, in turn, distribute the money to students in the form of savings grants or tuition scholarships for them to attend the secular and religious private schools they choose. The original businesses or individuals then receive a state tax credit for the amount they donated. That's how these work. 
So the businesses are obligated to pay taxes, or the individuals in Arizona are obligated to pay taxes. Instead of paying those taxes, they voluntarily, quote unquote, right, to use Dr. Evil's, right, you know, quote unquote, right? <laughs> they, uh, they give that money to these organizations instead. Now they know that that's not really, they're charitable, that's not a charity. They get a tax credit for that. that means whatever they give, they don't have to pay in taxes. So they really figure out their taxes and they just give what they owe in taxes and pay no taxes. That money goes. But instead of going to the state directly, it goes to the beneficiaries of the state. These private religious schools through these organizations. So, what is what are the names of tuition tax credit programs? Okay, tuition tax credit scholarships. These are the good names. Tuition tax credit savings grants. That's the name in Texas. Uh, this was the name in, in uh, Arizona. However, the bad names for it are unconstitutional redirected tax payments. A cynical sleight of hand, these are quotes, a shell game, and a legal fiction that tax credits are not state aid to private schools. This is a cryptic, that means hidden, slick scam. This is a scam. This is a duplicitous method of avoiding something, avoiding the constitutional disability of providing public tax money to religious schools. That's what they want to avoid. You know we have a federal law that prevents giving public money, and that includes any public money, federal, state, county, in a city, right, to a private religious school. What is that law called? Don't say separation of church and state or separation of religion and government. What is the name of that law that prevents that in the federal level? It's called the Establishment Clause, which is in the First Amendment of the Constitution, right? It's against the law to do that. So this is a scam. They're trying to avoid something by this roundabout shell game method, this sleight of hand, this legal fiction. And I hate to tell you, but it's succeeded. It has succeeded. But that's what, that's what this is. And I'm going to tell you how it succeeded here in a moment. Uh, why you need to participate in this voucher program. Now this, this is a diagram in Georgia. Georgia adopted this. They're calling it a voucher program, but they're using the tax credit method. That is now the method of choice for sending public money to, to religious schools. If, if the politicians of a state are so overwhelmingly religious and, and have nothing but contempt for the public education system, like they do in the 16 states I mentioned, they will use this method now by choice, the method of choice for doing this. You don't give vouchers. Vouchers have a bad name. Vouchers have failed, referenda after referenda. So, uh, you don't want to do that. We now know the right way to do it, the way that escapes legal scrutiny, has successfully evaded legal scrutiny. And Georgia describes it. Please note, a tax credit is not the same as a charitable donation. You will receive 100% of your contribution back from your Georgia taxes. Okay. The proportion of students attending public and private schools in the U.S. Blue is public, red is private. You see it's about 10%, but it varies from year to year. So um, private schools have always been around 10%. Um, Private school statistics, 10% of all students, that's about five, 5 million is 10%. Those are the ones in private schools. Okay. Where do private school students go to school? These are all the private schools we have. Catholic used to be over half. It's less now. It's still the largest by far. The Catholics have the largest private religious school system in the country. Still, but it used to be much bigger. Uh, conservative Christian has, has increased. This is the fundamentalist. Non-sectarian. Okay, that would be legitimate private schools. 
has increased. And then these are all small ones, small, small numbers. So we have statistics on these. Uh, these are referenda on vouchers and other tax aid to religious and private schools through the years. They always fail by approximately 60 to 65 percent. They always fail. They're always voted down. They lose. When the people actually see them on the ballot, they vote against sending public tax money to religious schools. They know where it's going. But private school choice programs are growing. Why? Just in the last few years. Why? Because they found the method. They found the method of choice for getting that state money. That method of choice is the tuition tax credit program. Now here we have Donna Campbell again. That is Kent Grisendorf. Uh, he was such an odious person that his district, the, 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 the Parent Teachers Association, and they were mostly Republican women, organized against him and unelected him, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. This is Arthur or Art Laffer. L A F F E R, the Laffer Curve. Yeah. He is the hack economist who will sell his, his knowledge of economics or what knowledge, little knowledge he has to uh, the right wing. He's a hack, hack economist. He wrote this for them, the Texas Economy and School Choice. He put it together from publicly available materials. And he probably made a minute. So there's so much money here, he probably got $100,000 at least for this, this hat job. This is a, a worthless publication. He has a chart in here, percent of net US jobs created in states without personal income taxes. There's Texas. We're so successful in Texas. Look at these other states. You see this? What's the reality? The reality is, as his, as his educated and knowledgeable critics pointed out, he cherry picks information. He misleads the reader. He takes, he, he engages in what's called pseudo scholarship, or pseudo science, right, where you use a fake science, like creationism, or saying that global warming is simply a natural warming cycle, right? Yeah, right, right. So uh, he engages in pseudo-scholarship, where he misleads the reader by cherry-picking data, presenting it in a way that looks correct, but is actually false. Here's the reality. Um, he took the exact period, 2002 to 2012, that had the highest uh, growth, growth rate taking place in Texas, 2002 to 2012, and he used that as the timeline here, uh, income tax in 2002-2012. He cherry-picked that. Now, what caused this pretty high rate of growth in Texas for this period? It was the discovery of hydraulic fracturing and the growth of the petroleum industry. This greatly increased the number of jobs in Texas. And this is why Perry goes around saying, oh, we have so many jobs in Texas. We, you know, it's, all due to, it's all due to the growth of the petroleum industry. It's a powerhouse, no doubt about it. We're addicted to oil. We, we drive automobiles, for the most part, that require fossil fuels. So we, we have to use that stuff. We're addicted to it. And Texas is the one that has it. We, Texas provides it. So um, when you need it, you got to get it. Here's some more, some more uh, statistics. Um, Texas tops the nation in low-wage workers. Now this is, uh, this is not from the Laffer study. This is the truth. Uh, we have the highest proportion of low-range service workers in the country. There's Texas in blue and the United States in red. Why is that? Because, uh, because of the industries we have, we don't need a lot of uh, high-tech workers. We need a lot of service workers. So we have a lot of low wages. Texas has very, it's a, you know, it's a right to work state, which means uh, a right not to work, basically. You have poor, poor laws governing labor relations. Uh, it's, it's a tough state to be a worker. You don't get paid much. Uh, one in four Texans lacks health insurance. Now, that's not so true anymore. Well, it used to be, for children, it was high. The poor children, it was 40% or something. 
25%. It's less now because of Obamacare, right? Or SCOTUS care. Okay. Now here we have Texas legislative bills for school choice. The last session, this is the session that just ended a few weeks ago. These bills were considered. Uh, these were related to a franchise or insurance premium tax credit, tax credit for contributions made to educational assistance organizations. We talked about that, right? Relating to the taxes for the educational assistance organization. Proposing a constitutional amendment prohibiting the authorization of funding of of uh, elementary or secondary education voucher program. That does not pass. Um, relating to state savings and government efficiency achieved through taxpayer savings grant, etc. So, a number of people proposed bills. Here are the two main ones. Donna Campbell proposed this one. Provide parents with a portion of their average state funding school districts per child to pay for private schools. But that's just, get, that's where the money goes. How does the money come in? This is from Paul Betancourt. This is the this is the tuition tax credit for, bis for businesses that I just described, where you get the money from the voluntary quote tax um, payments uh, going to these scholarships so that they get the tax credit. Now that you have the money set up in these or these educational assistance organizations, then they give it out as vouchers. Now, what happened to this? Oh. These two bills were combined into one bill called SB4, Senate Bill 4, which was the education bill for this. This is the one. This bill went through a legislative history. It passed the Senate. The, Senate, the Republican senators voted for it. And because they control the Senate, it passed the Senate. So that's pretty good. That's pretty close there. Then it was sent to the House, it, to the Way, was that the Ways and Means Committee? It has just sat there. That's where it ended up. It never moved from that committee. Here's another chart. This this is this is all online if you're interested in this, what happens to bills. It was filed out of Senate committee, voted on by the Senate, so it passed all these. The green means go. Good to go. Green means go. But then it never got out of the House committee. It was never voted on by the House. Never could be signed by the governor and did never became law. Why? What's going on here? It did not pass. This, this voucher scheme, and by the way, I want to emphasize the tuition tax credit scholarship savings grant program has exactly the same goal as vouchers, to get state money from the state to the religious schools. The effect is the same. It's, but instead of a direct payment, it's this roundabout shell game method that I described, right? So, Nothing's different from a voucher system in the effect, the goal. But why did it fail? It succeeded in 16 other states. In Texas, there is a coalition in the House of rural Republicans and all the Democrats. Now, all the Democrats by themselves can't stop it in the House. But if they have a large proportion of, Demo of Republicans, the rural Republicans, they have the votes to block it. And they have blocked these voucher bills every session for years. They said, this is not the first time it's happened. This is the first time we've had this tuition tax credit. And we've had voucher bills in the past. They're always blocked. Why? Well, the Democrats, of course, try to preserve public schools. So we know their motive. We want the public schools to, to remain. Because remember, the more you give money, state money, to private schools, the, um, the, less, the less there is for public schools, believe me. They, they claim that's not true, but it is. Public schools are paid by per pupil allowment. As those students leave the public schools and go to the private schools, they suffer. They get less money. There's no way around it. They, they, they get less money. Remember, the legislature took $5.4 from the public school four years ago. Two, two years ago. Did they give it back this year? No, they gave back $3 billion. They're still short. The public schools are still short. If you take even more money, million, hundreds of millions of dollars through this tuition tax credit, that really will hurt them. They, the public school system will suffer. In fact, the public school system in these states with tuition tax credit scholarships 
have suffered. They've all suffered because of this. So the Democrats want to protect public schools. What's the motive of the, of the rural Republicans? Who can tell me? What do you think? Why would they be against this? The, the Senate Republicans voted for it gladly. And I say rural Republicans in the House, the urban Republicans all voted for it, would vote for it. Why do the rural Republicans? You're, you're waiting for me to tell you, aren't you? Okay. They want to preserve the public school system, too. Their whole way of life depends on their public school system. Their Friday night football games, their kids. If they were hurt by private schools popping up, their public school system would deteriorate quickly. These are small, isolated, local public school systems. They know what can happen. If they're defunded even more, their public school system will suffer. Okay. So they're against it. Now, what are, the, what are the myths that you hear about these vouchers, these tax credit programs and these vouchers? Vouchers and tuition tax credit schemes are about choice. No, they're not. They're not. They already have choice. The people who want these already have the choice. They can send their kid to religious schools, but they have to pay for it themselves. The truth is, is that these, these schemes are about the state pay for their private religious school education. That's the truth. It's not about choice. They already have the choice. I emphasize that. That's the biggest lie there is right at the beginning. School choice is nonsense. They already have the choice. What they don't have is the state paying for their choice. They want that. That's what they're waiting for. Number two, voucher and tuition tax credit dollars in private schools are held accountable. No, they're not. A big important thing is that these religious schools and private schools are not held accountable by the state. The teachers are not certified. The schools are not certified. They don't take the state standardized tests. There's no accountability whatsoever. Instead, they teach, they teach the religious doctrines of the religion in that school, plus the other standard material the typical school stuff. Now I told you charter schools are not as good as public schools for the most part. I told you a few exceptions. What about private schools, the religious schools? How do you think they compare to public schools? They're far, far worse. They're even worse than the, than the public schools, than the, than the charter schools. Why? Because in these private schools they teach a fundamentalist religious biology, fundamentalist religious physics, they don't believe the Earth is old. They don't believe in radiometric data. They don't believe in evolution. So they teach biology all wrong. They have a crazy, bizarre history of American exceptionalism and Christian nationalism. So that's what they teach. They teach that nonsense. So the students come out with their heads filled with misinformation, with false information, with crazy ideas, with bizarre thinking. They, they memorize this stuff. They, they don't learn critical thinking at all because they don't want their children to question them. People who have the power of critical thinking question authorities. That's why critical thinking is not taught in Texas public schools. Even in the public schools, it's not taught. Now, some private schools you know are exceptional. The two best schools in Houston are what? Two private schools. Kincaid and St. John's. Those schools, their graduates, all go on to college, Lawyers, doctors, scientists, engineers, professional jobs. Believe me, I know that. I know. I knew the teachers there when I lived in Houston. I lived in Houston for 23 years. They had excellent students. That's where the wealthy oil company executives send their kids to Kincaid and St. John's. Excellent. That's all private. But they believe me. Whatever their their religion or their their party, they they want their children to get a good education. They don't care about the minorities in the public schools and the other schools. So private schools can be very good, but most of them are very bad because you get these, these wacko religious educations where they teach Noah's Ark and the flood. The earth was the surface of the planet was formed by the flood. And Noah had all his animals on his boat. And Adam and Eve were real people. That's why humans exist. That's what they teach them. So no accountability. They don't want accountability. They don't want the state telling them what to teach. 
Uh, do they improve the academic performance of students? Absolutely not. How could they? This is just a different way of paying for it. In fact, the teachers are worse in the, in the religious schools. They're not certified. They're not educated as well. Of course, the education is worse. And studies show this. There have been lots of studies to compare them. Again, you look at the teachers of King K and St. John's. Top teachers, you know, PhDs, professional degrees, good, good people with knowledge of science and engineering and law and stuff. That's, that's great. But that's two, two private schools in Houston. You're not going to uh, get that for all these students. Low income students and students with special needs have the most to gain from vouchers and tax credits. Absolutely not. In fact, they don't take students with special needs. They have, because they are private, they don't have to take them. Charter schools. Uh, they have done studies on the charter schools that do good. They have, they have, just, they have figured out that the, that the schools that have, the charter schools that have the highest uh, academic success, they achieve it by getting rid of the bad students. They find ways to get them out of the charter schools and back into the traditional public schools. Because they have a limited right, a limited way to get rid of students. And one way they do it is if the student is obnoxious or insolent or uh, violent, they can get rid of it. Rid, rid of the student, I should say. Get rid of him or her, not that. Him or her. So, um, of course, the religious schools can do that too. So, um, they have nothing to gain from this. That's a lot. Minority students will be especially able to benefit from vouchers and tax credits. No. In fact, that's the whole reason for tuition tax credits, to get your children out of the public schools away from the minorities that are now the dominant social group in those schools. The majority of students in Texas public schools are minorities. I said that. School vouchers are popular among the public. Well, I just showed you the chart, right? They're not. Vouchers have always been voted down when people know what they're voting for. They're not popular. Vouchers only go to private schools everyone approves of and that are high achieving. Nonsense. I'm not even going to explain that. It's nonsense. Voucher programs can actually save tax colored money at the, at the state and school district level. Aha! Here's how they do it. And that's partly true. And this is the really amazing thing. The, uh, the voucher or the tuition tax scholarship that is given to a student to go to a, to a religious school is less than the amount that the state gives a public school student, the school for that public school student. Right now, a public school student gets about $8,500. The, the school gets it for that student. The amount for a, um, a, a, a tax credit scholarship or a, or a voucher is less. It's, it's $6,000 something, $6,200. So the state can save money by pushing students away from the public schools to the private schools. They save $2,000 on every student that makes the move. But that, of course, is a horrible way to save. You're saving it at the expense of student education. Because now you're paying the public school students less per student because they're getting nothing for the students that's made the move. And they suffer for that. They get Less income. They need that income. And this is where all the savings come in. They say, oh, these are savings, tax savings, savings grants. Your state's going to save money. The state loses uh, money because its population is more poorly educated. The public school system lacks options. Well, obviously not. I showed you the list, right? Texas has all of those except one. It has private schools. It's just not they're not free. <laughs> they're not free for students to go to. Vouchers and tuition tax credits are legal and constitutional. All right. Yes and no. Yes and no. And I'll explain that very thing first. First, let me let me go back to this one to the uh, to the minorities. I think it was the previous one. Um, who makes use of these tuition tax credits and these, these, these scholarship grants? It's not the poor students. It's not the poor minority students. Why? 
because the private schools cost more than they're getting from each, each, each of the grants or the vouchers. That money has to be made up by the parents. The parents don't even have that to make up. The vast number of students who use that, that money, that grant, are the ones from well-to-do middle-class parents who can afford to make up the extra and send their kids to a private school. Probably the one they're being sent to right now. But if they can get some money from the state on the side, that's terrific. $6,000 a year, terrific. Maybe the tuition is $10,000 or $12,000. That's $6,200 less that they have to pay. That's who goes. That's who uses these things. It's not the poor or minority students. They do not benefit from this program. That's a lot. Now, let me explain this one. Are they legal and constitutional? Um, in, the, in, in the perfect world, they would not be legal and constitutional. They violate the Establishment Clause. They violate state law, which I'll get to in a moment. But because of people uh, working in the legal system and judges, they, uh, they have been able to get this approved in some states. So yes, it is legal and constitutional. If they pass it in Texas, would it be legal? Yes, I'm afraid it would be. As incredible as it seems, if it was passed in Texas, the, t the state could send its money through this system, this, this scholarship system, to the private school. How do they do it? OK, let's very quickly go through two, two court, court cases. Zellman versus Simmons Harris, 2002. This was a case decided by the United States Supreme Court, which tested the allowance of school vouchers in relation to the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. It's, it's one of the most important establishment, establishment Clause cases in a century. A divided court upheld an Ohio school voucher plan. Now, we just saw yesterday six justices support ACA, Obamacare, the American the, uh, Affordable Care Act. And you have good feelings about Kennedy and Roberts, right? And today, uh, gay marriage was approved with Kennedy, four Democrats and Kennedy. So you feel pretty good about Anthony Kennedy, right? You shouldn't. You feel good about Roberts for writing a nice opinion yesterday about the AFA, the ACA? No. Uh, you shouldn't feel good about it. That was a good decision. In that context, with that law, it was good. But actually, Kennedy and Roberts, and of course Alito, Scalia, and Thomas have been very, very, very bad. This law upholding Ohio vouchers was decided on a, in a 5-4 decision. Um, Rehnquist and O'Connor were two of the five, along with Scalia, Thomas, and, um, and Kennedy. Uh, Rehnquist was replaced by Roberts. O'Connor was replaced by um, Alito. So, um, it's a 5-4 decision. Vouchers are legal in the United States. This is the program. It did not violate the Establishment Clause that justice is ruled. You should not feel proud of our justices, 5-4. Under the private choice test developed by the court for this voucher program, it must meet the following criteria. It must have a valid secular purpose. To send the kids to a private school with a, with a state voucher must have a valid secular purpose. State money used for uh, religious education. What could that be? Aid must go to parents and not to the schools. Okay, that did happen. A broad class of beneficiaries must be covered. You can't discriminate. The program must be neutral with respect to religion, and there must be adequate non-religious options. They decided that was all the case. The valid secular purpose was providing educational assistance to poor children in a demonstrably failing public school system. The vouchers were given to the parents. The broad class was all the students, etc., etc. I'm going to keep jumping ahead. Rehnquist said. The incidental, the incidental advancement of a religious mission or the perceived endorsement of a religious message is reasonably attributable to the individual aid recipients, not the government, whose ends, whose role ends with the disbursement of benefits. 
Now that is so arbitrary and cynical and hypocritical, but that's what he wrote. Anyway, they, uh, they upheld it, and it violated the, uh, the disbursement of money test, one of the three prongs of the lemon test, giving, giving state money to private religions. It violated that, but they overlooked that. Uh, the dissenters wrote, the voluntary character of the private choice to refer to a parochial education over an education of only system seems to be quite irrelevant to the question whether the government's choice to pay for religious indoctrination is constitutionally permissible. Stevens realized this was a hoax, this was a scam. This reasoning was faulty. It was intentionally and deliberately faulty. I'm telling you that now. This was not a mistake. They intentionally and deliberately change the rules of the game in mid-career, just like this. This precedent was totally overturned, not giving public money to private religious schools. But they did it. Stevens objected. Souter questioned the court. He said, this, this uh, overturns the, Ever the Everson precedent. He found that the religious instruction and secular education could not be separated, and this itself violated the Establishment Clause. Absolutely correct. It violates the Establishment Clause. But yet it passed by the floor. So don't feel so good about our Supreme Court justices. In summary, the Supreme Court held in Zellman versus Simmons Harris that a voucher program is constitutional if there's a valid secular purpose, such as providing educational assistance to poor children. If the public financial assistance is neutral with respect to religious and secular schools, that means the money, there's no preference for aid to be given to specifically religious schools, but it's made available to all schools. It is. But who takes that money? It's the religious schools. In Arizona, they have, they have this thing. 90% of the money goes to religious schools. In Texas, it would be 85%. Sure, the, the, the private, the secular private schools, secular ones, could take the money, almost no. And the money is provided to the parents, not to the schools. Now we come to James G. Blaine. Look at this guy. He is a 19th century politician. He's a good one. He's a Republican during this era, the second half of the 19th century. The Republicans were the progressive people. They were, they were progressives. The Democrats were the stick in the mud, defenders of, of uh, keeping the South happy. The Republicans were the progressives. This man was a good man. He had a brilliant career. He was a member of the House of Representatives. He was Speaker of the House. He came up with the Blaine Amendment in 1875. This, pro, this amendment codified the church-state separation Blaine and Grant were promoting. It states, now this is very important, you should read this, no state shall make any law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now that's the quote from the First Amendment, the, the two religion clauses in the First Amendment. They're called the, uh, the Establishment Clause and the Separation Clause. excuse me, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. And no money raised by taxation in any state for the support of public schools are derived from any public school fund or anything, or any public lands, shall ever be, ever be under the control of any religious sect, nor shall any money so raised be devoted, to be divided between religious sects or denominations. So no public money to religious denominations or sects for public education or for anything. That was the Blaine Amendment to the Constitution. The effect of the Blaine Amendment was to prohibit the use of public funds for any religious school, although it did not advance Grant's other aim of requiring states to provide public education to all children. The bill passed the House but failed by a very small margin in the Senate. It almost became law, constitutional amendment. But it failed. Um, 
Although it never passed to left, Mullane opened the charges to any Catholicism. Catholicism, because public schools in the 19th century were Protestant. Uh, the proposed amendment served Lane's purpose of rallying Protestants to the Republican Party and made him one of the leaders. Later, he was a candidate for president three times. On the first time, he was nominated by Robert Ingersoll, one of our great heroes, the, the, uh, the great agnostic, who was actually an atheist, too. But he said that he called himself an agnostic. He didn't believe in God, so he was an atheist. But he called himself the, the great agnostic because atheism sounds so bad. <laughs> so he did that. But he was a friend of, of Blaine. Um, Hayes was nominated and won. The Republicans won all these elections. So if Blaine had been elected and had been gotten the nomination, he would have won. So he served in the United States Senate. It's dead. He was again a candidate for president. He lost the nomination to James A. Garfield. Uh, under Garfield's administration, his very brief administration, because as you know, he was assassinated. He was Secretary of State. Um, he was again a candidate for president. He won the nomination that year, but that was the year that the Republicans lost. He lost to the Democrat Grover Cleveland in a very close election. So he was Secretary of State again. This man had served every, every office except president. He was an amazing figure. He was a good guy. Um, he was a progressive. I believe, since he was Ingersoll's, Ingersoll's friend, and also Grant, Grant was also um, not, didn't care much about religion. Ingersoll really, really disliked it. I don't think Blaine liked it either. I think these people were free thinkers. They were like us. Now, the Blaine Clause, the Blaine Amendment, whoops, the Blaine Amendment got into, there, there's the Blaine Amendment, it got into the Texas Constitution. In fact, it got into the Texas Constitution in 39 states. Why? Because after it failed as a national constitutional amendment, 39 states adapted it in their constitutions because they didn't want money to be appropriated or drawn from the treasury for the benefit of any sect or religious society, theological or religious seminary, or property belonging to the state to be appropriated for any such purpose. And the available school fund, which as you know funds our, our public school system, um, shall be applied annually to the support of the public free schools. The legislature may not enact a law appropriating any part of the permanent school fund or available school fund um, for any other purpose. The permanent school fund and the available school fund may not be appropriated to or used for the support of any sectarian school. The available school fund shall be distributed to the, uh, for, it should only be used for the, for the public schools. So here we have two blame clauses in our Texas Constitution. And they make it pretty clear that money, state money, should not go to religious schools. Doesn't that sound good? So how come it can't? How come other states with the same clauses like Arizona are giving money? Arizona has now given $350 million since their program started from the state to the public schools, to the, to the religious schools. $350 million. 90% goes to religious schools. And they have the same clauses in their constitution. The reason is because there's a way around the, the blame clauses. The Supreme Court did it. Remember, federal law trumps state law. The people advocating for the tuition tax credits in the Texas Senate know about this. They understand that the blame clauses are irrelevant in our constitution because of the method that was discovered, the method of choice, the tuition tax credit scholarships. And uh, I'm not going to show you that for lack of time, but it does show the Texas troublemakers. It shows me, Kathy Miller, and Stephen Green. Now, you know me. You know Kathy Miller. Uh, Jonathan Sainz gets on and talks about this on a TV clip. Who's Stephen Green? Well. I acknowledge that Kathy Miller and TFN have, have done twice what I have in, in the time 
we've overlapped. They, they've really done good work because it's just me and my organization, and they have a staff of people, and they, they, they do pretty well. But what does Stephen Green do? Well, he's done 10 times as much as TFN Army, 10 times as much. Uh, they hate me just as much. I'm glad to, I'm, I'm honored to be up there with Stephen Green. Let's just say that. He's written these books. He has written a book showing that uh, the Constitution uh, does not support teaching religion in the public schools. And it has been, and it should not have been, and it was correct to remove it. He also just came out with this book, Inventing a Christian America, The Myth of the Religious Founding. You've heard of Christian nationalism. You, the United States is a Christian country. It was founded to be a Christian country. False. He proves it beyond a shadow of a doubt. He wrote a great article showing that, in fact, the Ten Commandments were used as the basis of law in some colonies. It failed miserably. The Ten Commandments uh, are completely incompetent to be, to be laws in any human society. They had to revert back to British common law. And here's the book, The Second Disestablishment, Church and State in 19th Century America, where he shows that um, the government began to, to get away from uh, religion in the schools and religion in other things, such as universities. Uh, the second disestablishment means that religion, which had been established in universities and in the schools and in the government, was removed. That was the second disestablishment. What was the first disestablishment of religion in our country? Do you know what it was? This is the second. The first one was the Constitution itself. Our founding fathers deliberately set up a country where religion was irrelevant. The, the government uh, has safeguards from religion. So they, they disestablished religion and state. They specifically cut religion out of government. The second one was, is this one, was the blame clauses, the removal of funding of, of religious schools, uh, removing the, um, the established churches in states um, and universities. A lot of well-known universities, Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, were all founded as religious universities. They, they disestablished their religious origins. So, um, he's a good man. Now, this is the reason why they can get away with it. Um, this court case, which few people apparently know about, Arizona Christian School Tuition Organization, they invented this. Rather than go into detail, since we're running out of time, I really... Um, have to get going, I'm sorry to say. Um, the um, program here was that parents would get money by giving money to the, to, for a tax, voluntary tax organization. The money would come back to them for their, for their students to go to religious schools. It's a giveaway. It was, um, it was litigated, litigated before the Supreme Court. And Justice Kennedy, the one who's so nice to us for the gays, the gay Americans, and for supporting the ACA, actually wrote an opinion um, overturning the precedent of Flats v. Cohen. And he allowed th this method, this slick, this slick legal sleight of hand, this legal fiction of giving money. He, he took it at face value that this really was disconnected, giving money voluntarily to an organization was now disconnected from the state. And when that money then went to, public, to religious schools, that's OK. And they got tax credits for it. He allowed that. And the vote was 5 to 4. Uh, Justice Kagan dissented. She said, really, that's the same thing. The money is going from the state. That's state money. It's tax money. It was supposed to go to the state. Now it's going to religious schools. And she castigated him for the, for the Turning, overturning the precedent. Now this gets more complicated. We, I'm afraid we have to get going. What's the reason why the Supreme Court did it? Why did these five justices vote in this way for something that is so obviously crooked and slick and irrational and uh, is obviously a slick uh, sucker's bet? It's, it's a shell game. Why did they do it? 
It's because these five guys, these five white guys, are Catholics. Alito, Thomas, Scalia, Roberts, and Kennedy. Now this was the Hobby Lobby ruling, but it was the same thing. We have six white conservative Republicans who want the Catholic Church to get that, that money in this way. And a lot of it goes to the Catholic Church. Now, so, uh, Sonia Sotomayor is Catholic. She's a Democrat, so she doesn't um, follow them. Breyer, Kagan, and Ginsburg are Jews. We are, there are no Protestants on the Supreme Court right now. So this picture is even, even more obvious. Who do they serve? Not the American people. Who do they serve? They serve their Catholic, their Catholic private schools, their religious schools. So this crazy uh, Supreme Court's rulings, which, which actually violate common sense, uh, are responsible for allowing this to happen. And, and it will. Um, it's, it will. If it was passed, this would happen. It's legal. Now, when I say that it's really illegal, why? Because it's one vote. If we got if we could change the proportion of these people in the Supreme Court, it would be five to four the other way, right? All these, the, this, this public money going to private schools, it would be gone. It would stop. They would stop the violations of the Establishment Clause. They would stop Citizens United. They would stop the gerrymandering. They would stop all the advantages that the Supreme Court gives the Republicans and corporations and war-making people. That would stop. See, all the Republicans have left right now well, they have both houses of Congress, I guess, but they, they have the Supreme Court. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I couldn't show this, these pictures everywhere, but for this group, it's okay. I can believe that.